centrifugal and Coriolis forces and we're going to pick up pretty much where we left off yesterday so we have for an arbitrary vector Q um, a relationship between the time derivative of that vector in a rotating reference frame and a stationary inertial reference frame and in that relationship is um, a term here omega which is the angular velocity of the rotating reference frame relative to the stationary um, or inertial reference frame. And for much of the lecture today, it's actually going to be helpful to think about the rotating reference frame to essentially be the Earth itself. Um, and the stationary reference frame essentially to be the universe that the Earth is sitting in. Okay, So what we're doing here is working out ways to handle the fact that um, the Earth, although the rotation is slow, is a rotating reference frame and the forces that emerge from that, okay? And so the natural place to start here is to connect Newton's second law, which we've seen all the way through the course so far, to this relationship that we have um, from yesterday's lecture, okay? So we can start in here by writing um, M um, R double dot, as um, basically the second time derivative of just a position vector r. And you can see that bolts pretty cleanly um, into this expression here, right? So we can bring ourselves one other thing in here, which is to say that dr in d on dt in our frame uh, s0 um, is equal to dr on dt um, in our frame s plus uh, omega times r. Okay, so all I've done is replace my arbitrary vector q with a position vector r so that I can compare it between my two coordinate systems. Okay, and just to remind you, the inertial reference frame is s0, um, so it's this one on the left. All right, um, we can come in here and um, differentiate both sides with respect to t, okay? Because what we're after um, from this line above here is actually the second derivative with respect to time, okay? So here, dr on dt, d squared r on dt squared, um, keeping track of the frame will become um, d on dt, and we'll keep this in S0 for the moment, um, acting on dr on dt in S0, okay? So just a little bit of um, spelling out the notation there. And of course, now what we have here is d on dt in S0. Um, this term on the right, we can bring the line above down. So this will be dr on dt of s plus omega cross r, like so. And we kind of need to be careful about what's happening with, um, with our time derivative here, right? Because we can't just be completely ambiguous about time derivatives between frames for exactly the reason we saw in the last lecture, right? Um, you kind of have to work out whether the vector's changing or the coordinate system is changing. And so what we're going to do here is actually write the expression that we've got here on this slide with blanks in it, just to make it really obvious what I mean here. So what we can do is write this as d on dt of a blank um, in our s naught frame. It's almost just ripping the vector out, okay, on both sides. So this would be... Um, now d on dt of a blank in S uh, plus omega cross blank in here, okay? And of course, 
I can I can come in here now and just erase my blank right and assume that there's nothing there and so what I'm really saying here is if I want to take a time derivative from my s naught frame what I have to do is take uh, the time derivative in my s frame which is a rotating one but also account for the fact that I have to deal with the angular um, velocity in here okay so there's going to be a cross product with whatever I apply it to so what we're going to have here is uh, this expression here, let's call it 1 for a second, is now going to become something that looks a little bit like this. Um, dr, uh, dr squared um, on dt squared s naught is going to be, and I'm going to take this expression and apply it in there. Okay, So what I'm going to get is um, d on dt of s um, acting on... Um, on this piece, so this will give me dr on dt of s um, plus omega cross r, like so, plus omega cross the thing that I'm taking the derivative of, right? So this would be in here again, dr on dt of s plus um, uh, omega cross r. Okay, so all I've done here is basically just apply um, the same vector relationship that I have here first to my position vector and then to taking the time derivative of that derivative of the, of, of the position vector, okay? And so we can make our notion, notation here a little easier by going back to our dot notation, okay? So this is now... Um, um, R double dot in S naught um, is going to be here. Um, we can work this through. This is now D on DT of um, everything on this right hand side now is in the frame S. So I'm going to drop the frame S over there. Um, DR on DT um, plus um, D on dt uh, and we're going to take the omega here cross r um, plus um, omega cross dr on dt like so okay and so these two terms that i just had here are basically the um, product rule when i take the derivative just there okay um, now we're also going to have a term in here, omega cross dr on dt, okay, which is uh, now this term just here. And then on the end here, we're going to have an extra term, which is going to be omega cross omega cross r, like so. Okay. All right. There's... Um, one, two, three, four, five terms in here, and one of those terms um, we can make go away essentially by relying on the fact that omega is constant, right? So we can say d omega on dt equals zero as omega is a constant. And for today, that's perfectly good because we're dealing with something like the Earth rotating and it's rotating at a constant um, constant velocity, right? Every day is roughly 24 hours long and, well, it's exactly 24 hours long. Um, maybe a tiny little gap at the end where we have to put, you know, leap days and leap hours and leap stuff in, but 24 hours, constant rotation, and so we don't need to worry about a d uh, omega on dt term, okay? But I want you to be aware it's there because sometimes in other subjects, you know, there's bits of astronomy and stuff like that where this term actually pops out and it generates you another inertial force that's often called the transfer force. Um, so now we can knock out that term there. And the other thing that you'll spot in here is one of these terms in here appears twice. This one and this one is the same term. So we're going to get a 2 in here as well. Okay. So we can write this thing, r double dot, s naught is equal to um, r double dot in front, which let's just make it clear that it's in frame s, um, just to keep things clean for the moment, um, plus 2 omega cross r dot. Um, 
plus omega cross omega cross r. And the brackets are optional. Um, sometimes we put them in there just to um, make it clear which one was the cross product first, but it doesn't matter which, which order you do the brackets um, in that particular situation, okay? All right, so we've got a way to convert from one frame um, to another. And now what we want to do is go back to forces, right? So you'll remember we started out here with um, m um, d squared r on dt squared is equal to our force f. Um, this term over on the left here now would be um, m um, r double dot um, plus 2 gamma cross r um, plus, um, not gamma, omega, um, omega cross r. Having one of those days when my brain just substitutes Greek letters at random when I say them, it's a bit strange. My brain is a funny beast. Um, like so. And of course, we can now pull the MR out here. So this is MR double dot um, is equal to F minus, oops, that's a minus sign just there, minus 2 omega cross M R um, uh, vector um, minus M omega cross omega cross R. Okay? So all I've really done here is basically um, take this in my S naught frame, drop in here my result for my S frame. Um, my force is still my force. Um, it, we made a sort of an implicit frame transfer there, but that's okay. Um, and then um, I basically just pulled all the terms over the other side. Okay. Um, so in here we now have um, F um, plus 2MR dot cross uh, omega um, plus M um, omega cross R cross omega. Okay, and all I've really done here is just rely on a relation of A cross B um, equals minus B cross A. Okay, and so you'll notice in both of those terms on the end to get rid of the minus sign, all I've done is just swap one of the cross products around to get it. And this is one of the places where you've got, kind of got to be careful if you're working from book to book to book in mechanics. Some books will carry the minus sign, some books will make it a plus by um, reversing the cross product. And then some will have the terms on different sides in this equation. So this is one of the ones when you compare, compare one book to another, you've kind of got to be careful about what they're doing because the minus signs can kind of get a little trappy, so to speak. Um, and so this thing we can call our force F um, minus um, uh, force that we're going to call here the Coriolis force, uh, sorry, plus, plus a force that we're going to call the centrifugal force or CF in here, okay, where you can basically directly relate this thing to this term and this thing here to this term in the end, okay. Um, all right, so um, what we basically said here is that. Um, This is our force in SO, um, S0. And then over on this left hand side, we've made a transformation to um, our S frame. And let's keep this as S0 just to keep track of what's going on in here, okay? Um, and then this will be S0, this will be S0, this will be S0 in here. And then this thing here is really just now my F in my frame S because I made that transformation. Okay, so this now cleans this up at the end, right? Um, so what we're really doing here is saying that if we consider a force in our inertial frame 
um, and compare it to a force in our rotating frame. There, in translating between the two, there are an extra two forces that come up that are inertial forces. Actually, there's three, and we killed one earlier when we said um, d omega um, on dt is zero, right? But um, for, for constant speed of rotation, there's two forces, and one we call the centrifugal force, and the other we call um, the Coriolis force, okay? Um, centrifugal force, most of you will be familiar with, and if anything, it's one of those strange things that happens when you learn um, physics. I sort of remember it myself coming through high school, always knowing what centrifugal force is, right? You, you spin something around and it sticks to the wall and everyone talks about centrifugal forces. And then you come into your first undergraduate or high school physics course and you get told, no, 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 there's no such thing as the centrifugal force. It's the centripetal force and it's the force acting to make things go around in circles. Um, the reality is that the centrifugal force is not a, no, 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 that thing doesn't exist. The centrifugal force is essentially an inertial force that comes about because of rotating frames, but you don't really see a reason for it until you get to rotating frames, you know, like in a high year mechanics course. And in the end, it's kind of a match for the centripetal force and when you come in as a sort of beginning high school student in physics or an undergraduate in physics, um, you don't understand all of the mechanics of frames relative to each other and all that sort of stuff. So the easiest thing to do is just to say there's no centripetal force um, and it's just the centripetal force, which is the thing that makes it go around the circle, okay? Um, in some ways, you can see this as um, when you do your um, gravitational problems in first year, you have, you know, an object sits on a surface, there's gravity and there's a normal force acting back to stop that thing going um, through. Um, you can kind of, and you've got a pair, you've got a normal force and a gravitational force um, coming about as a pair to constrain the motion, okay? And the way to think about this here is that you've now got a constrained motion, you've got an object that needs to go in a circle, and there's a balance of two forces here. There's a centrifugal force that sort of acts outwards, um, radially out, and then a centripetal force that acts inwards that sort of pulls um, this thing into a circle. And that's kind of a very similar um, sort of inertial force, real force pair, um, much as you would have with uh, gravity and normal force, okay? So that's probably the most sensible way to think about it. But Ultimately, centrifugal force really doesn't pop out in mechanics until you deal with comparing um, rotational frames with inertial frames, okay? And so sometimes we call this like a fictional um, force. Um, I called it incorrectly earlier, transverse force, not transfer force. I've never used it, so um, it's hard to remember what its name is. And then the other one that we pop out here is a thing called the Coriolis force which people will have heard of, um, maybe not have done it in detail because until you have rotating frames, you can't really do it properly. And it's a velocity dependent force. So if you have an object that's at rest in a rotating frame, then that term goes to zero as well, okay? So in a lot of cases, you only have one term coming about because of your rotating frame and that's the centrifugal force. It's the one that's always there. But um, if you have an object moving in um, a rotating frame, then you will also have a Coriolis force. And if you have the angular momentum of, uh, angular velocity of the rotating frame changing, you'll get an additional force in here called the transverse force, okay? I'll let that pop out in other places. All right, so the way I wanna do this is in this first half, I'm gonna deal with centrifugal force. Um, it's fairly simple, doesn't take very long, give, it, give a nice example of it. And then in the second half of the lecture, I'm gonna come back and do Coriolis force in a bit more detail because it's the one you won't be so familiar with. And um, that one might end up being slightly longer because at the end, I wanna do Foucault pendulum, um, which is a really nice example of a way of measuring um, Coriolis force, okay? All right, so centrifugal force, um, we see diagram that we saw yesterday. So um, centrifugal force is what we call an inertial force. Um, you won't have seen it in a formal physics course so far because in inertial frames, which all the way through your un undergraduate studies to, to now, you've been dealing with inertial frames, um, this force doesn't exist in inertial frames, right? 
um, only the centripetal force exists um, when you're dealing just with simple inertial frame um, mechanics. And so it's usually applied in two scenarios. Um, one is like a spinning disk scenario. So you can imagine, you know, um, if you think about problems that you might get in, you know, tutorials and exams and stuff, they usually have two forms. One is you've got a spinning disk and you've got something sitting on it, right? And you want to work out um, what the force driving it radially is due to that rotating um, reference frame that it's sitting on. The other one is what I call a spinning sphere scenario. So you basically have some sphere, it's rotating on its own axis, and then you want to work out what the force is acting outwards. Um, and it can be a little trickier because it depends where you are on the sphere as to what direction it acts, right? So um, if you've got a spinning sphere like this, if you're on the top, there's no centrifugal force at all because you're on the axis of rotation. Um, if you're on the equator here, then it acts upwards. And if you're on some, you know, mid-latitude here, it will act that way um, because you're spinning around this. And so it's, it's actually a non-vertical force, okay? All right, um, and there's one little quick mathematical step we can take in here, which is you remember um, on the derivation we just got that um, this force is uh, omega cross r cross omega. Um, yesterday we looked at this um, omega cross r and what happens here is that one of the cross products becomes um, uh, gives you a sign right so in your cross product you've got magnitude one vector magnitude the other sign of the angle in between that sign of the angle in between will ultimately pop you out this row here, okay, as the um, sort of component of uh, this colatitude angle, as we discussed in, in yesterday's lecture. So if it, it doesn't make immediate sense, pop back and have a look at yesterday's notes. And then um, we get um, uh, our us usual expression for centripetal force here. So you remember centripetal force is m r omega squared pointing um, along radial. Um, usually it's inwards because you're pulling in. Um, and so you get the same magnitude here once you do this cross product, right? Um, uh, this first cross product here um, will point tangentially, as we saw yesterday. Um, then when you take the cross product with um, the uh, angular momentum vector up here, you end up with something that points out radially, okay? And so that's obviously the second one's going to be at 90 degrees, so that second sign term becomes um, 1. And so what you're left with here is something that's equivalent in magnitude to your um, centripetal force, okay? Um, hence my mentioning just before that it comes out as a nice little pair. Okay, um, you've all done centripetal force to death in first year, and this is really just the mirror of it. So I'm going to do one quick example just to highlight how it looks for the trickier situation, which is a spinning sphere, namely the Earth. Okay, so here's sort of a, a typical centrifugal force example that you might have. So come back to our skydiver from uh, lecture one or two. Um, imagine skydiver jumping out of a plane at some latitude um, phi. Um, you know, it might be in Sydney at minus 33 degrees or it might be on the equator at zero degrees. Um, how does the centrifugal force due to the Earth's rotation affect their free fall under gravity, okay? So the, if I was approaching this as a, as a real problem, my first step in here in any spherical problem like this is to make sure that I'm clear about my angles, right? Um, if the question is giving you a latitude, make sure you convert it to something that's a co-latitude to deal with, um, with your problem, okay? It's a, if, if I think about all the problems that I've seen in the past, with this sort of thing in it, the most common mistake is just forgetting to do this and all the numbers come out wonky at the end, okay? So here, it's a si fairly simple relationship. Our theta here is just 90 degrees minus um, phi. And hopefully most of you worked that out as a sort of little homework exercise at the back of um, yesterday's lecture. And so our um, phi here runs between minus 90 degrees and 90 degrees. And um, our theta here runs between 0 and pi, 
All right, so we can um, write a um, force equation for this. And basically what we're going to have is M R double dot is going to be made up of three forces. But for the moment, let's ignore the Coriolis force, right? We'll remove the motion um, of the skydiver just to keep things nice and simple. So what we would have here is a force due to gravity and a force... Um, that's a centrifugal force component, okay? And so if we, um, actually it's better just to do it on the slide. Um, if we think about our skydiver up here, there's going to be naturally a force acting towards the centre of the Earth, um, which is gravity. Um, we all know about it if you've ever fallen down before. And there's going to be a centrifugal force here that acts um, outwards, right? Now, there's one imperfection in this problem, and the imperfection in this problem is that the um, skydiver is not actually attached to the Earth. So, in principle, the Earth is rotating underneath them, and the skydiver is actually moving relative, you know, is, is, has whatever position and velocity they're doing um, mechanically disconnected from the Earth, okay? So, we're taking in this question a little bit of a... Imp implicit assumption that basically, you know, as the Earth rotates, the skydiver rotates around with it, okay? Um, perhaps a better way to think of this problem would be what would be the force if you were sitting, like me, on the Earth and not falling from the sky, okay? But we want to apply gravity in here, so that's a um, really common way to see this problem co um, cooked up. So, um, our force due to gravity is, um, would normally just be our Newtonian um, gravity in here, right? So G M M on um, R squared um, R hat, like you've seen in your first year co courses, um, or M G naught, okay? And so I'm going to use G naught all the way through this problem and the one in the other half of the lecture as um, a gravitational constant that applies even or in the case when the Earth is not spinning, okay? So it's it's kind of a pure... Um, gravity effect with the centrifugal force not accounting for it. As we'll show later on, um, if I was to measure gravity right now with a gravimeter or a pendulum or whatever it is, that centrifugal force would be automatically built into the G that I would measure um, simply because um, the Earth is rotating and I can't stop it rotating very easily anyway. Um, all right. So... That, that would be, we could call this kind of like a, a true acceleration um, due to gravity in here, all right? Um, our okay, so we can write as our next step here, force due to gravity um, plus... Uh, force um, CF. Now I want. Now I worked out what's going on. I, le I left a um, left a subscript out on my notes. I'll catch that one later. Um, so this would be m g naught plus m omega squared r sine theta um, rho hat. Okay. And so all I've done here as that step is basically um, take this first cross product in here and um, that gets me a um, R sine theta term and I've defined a direction rho hat which is basically just pointing outwards along here same as I did on that previous slide and then taking that second cross product, okay? Um, and this thing now I can call, uh, you know, sort of my, this would now be my new total force. And I can call it just an mg, um, where this g is now an effective force um, made up of my true gravitational force plus um, a term here, uh, omega squared r sine um, theta rho hat, okay? All right, 
the thing we have to be careful about here is we've got vectors and we've got directions and the g that I just wrote has um, one component of the acceleration pointing inwards and actually the um, other component of the acceleration is not even pointing directly outwards necessarily it's pointing at some tangential and radial components in there okay so we need to break this up into components and so um, extremely badly drawn um, hand-drawn circle uh, we can come out to our position here so this would now be our row just here this would be our angle theta and we can consider our components. So we're going to have um, our force due to gravity acting inwards. We're going to have our um, centrifugal force is going to act that way. And it's going to have two components um, in this. There's going to be a, a FCF radial and an FCF um, let's call it tangential tan. Okay, and straight up, we know that this angle just here is going to be 90 minus theta, and then by opposite angles, that one is 90 minus theta. Um, and I can draw a little thing here. Uh, this angle just um, in the, actually that's, I fooled myself a little bit here. Let's just draw this properly. That would come out there, that would come out there, this would come out to the corner. As you can tell, my drawing skills are not always that great. Um, but as long as it's clear. Um, and so the ang that angle there is going to be 90 degrees, and this one in here will be theta as well. Okay, And so we can work out our components in here. This thing is now going to be... Um, we're going to have um, hypotenuse... This is now the um, opposite, so it's going to be sine. Um, so this will be F, C, F, sine, theta. And this one here will be F, C, F, cos, theta. Okay? And that's my approach to getting components all the time, is just to try and identify which one's the opposite, which one's the adjacent, and sine, sine, and cos um, accordingly. And so if we think about um, what's going on here now, the, the force equation I've written up here is correct and it's correct because um, the directional components are still buried in the unit vectors but if I want to consider magnitudes here and I do my radial um, um, acceleration due to gravity is actually going to be G naught acting inwards okay um, so I'm going to assume that this now has a, a this direction to it um, minus um, omega squared r sine squared theta and that's going to come about because um, I've got one term of sine theta um, coming from the cross products I do to get um, that component and then another um, term in sine theta popping up because I have to take the um, radial component of it okay and so this is this is now a, a scalar quantity okay um, where this minus sign has popped out just by direction um, components. Okay, um, and it should be pretty obvious um, in here that the um, place where the centrifugal force component acting sort of against gravity is going to be strongest will be at the equator, okay? Um, because you will, there you will have your entire radial component acting against um, what's happening in, in, in our gravity, okay? So um, we can work out how large this term on the end is. Um, and so what we have here is omega squared r sine um, squared theta is going to be um, our omega, we can just um, work it out as two pi radians every 24 hours, right? So it ends up being um, 7.3 by 10 to the minus five uh, radians per second um, squared. Um, the radius of the Earth is 6,400 um, kilometers. So it's gonna be 6.4 by 10 
to the 6 and um, we're going to have, because we're at the equator, um, our phi is 0 degrees, which means our theta is 90 degrees. So this is going to be sine squared 90 degrees. And um, if you work this thing out, it works out to be 0 0.034 meters um, per second squared, um, which in a typical gravity of maybe you know 10 meters per second squared, it's around about 0.34 percent. Quite small, but it's measurable, right? Um, modern gravimeter is good to about one part in 10 to the nine or so, so you can certainly detect that magnitude of effect if you really wanted to, okay? And the last thing um, I'll catch just in here before the break um, is to look at the tangential component for a second. It's also very small. Um, so if you consider this um, tangential component, um, it's going to be a maximum at the 45 degree position, right? Um, and the reason for that is if you go up onto the pole, um, the centrifugal force is zero because you're um, not actually rotating about the axis. If you go to the equator down here, um, your centrifugal force is a maximum, but it's entirely pointing um, radially, so there's no tangential component. And it turns out the maximum for your um, tangential component turns out at 45 degrees, okay? And that comes about, um, in uh, a cause in, in this term here, okay? So um, what we can do here is write um, G tangential component will now be omega squared R sine theta. And instead of adding in a, a sine theta on, we add a cos theta on because of um, this term just here, right? So this is now cos theta. Right. Um, if we we need a little bit of geometry in here. Um, if we consider, actually, let me draw it because it'll make more sense. If we now consider, you know, here's our corner on the Earth. We've got uh, the center of the Earth origin down here. Um, and our skydiver or whatever we're dealing with um, just uh, above. We would have G rad just here. We would have G tangential um, just here. And um, this would give us some G down here, like so, um, with some little angle alpha just in between, right? So tan of alpha is going to be G tan on g rad. Okay, so this is just trig. And then, of course, for very small angles, and we know it's going to be a small angle, um, that tan is basically equal to alpha. Okay, so what we can do down here is go alpha is going to be equal to um, omega squared r sine theta cos theta on um, g naught minus uh, omega squared um, r sine squared theta. And then if you plug a whole bunch of numbers into this thing and work it out at the end, and um, to keep this short, I'll let you do that for yourself as an exercise, or if you have a look at my notes, I've put the numbers in. Um, this ends up being something like 0 0.0017 radians or about 0.1 degrees. Okay, It's a really, really tiny component, even at that 45 degree position. Enough so that you don't really notice in this specific problem that gravity points well away from downwards. But if you're wanting to be really precise about things, um, it does matter. So the common approach to defining vertical um, in any particular position is basically just um, to take a pendulum and make it not swing, right? It's a thing that uh, if you do trades, you call a plumb line. And you basically hang this thing and it tells you vertical. And what's interesting to note is that if the Earth stopped rotating, there would be a very, very small change in what you would define as vertical on the Earth. 
because of this component um, of um, centrifugal force acting tangentially depending on where you are okay and so it would vary based on on where you are in latitude as well such that uh, it would make absolutely no difference to what you define as vertically downwards if you're standing on the equator because there's no tangential component to the centrifugal force but if you're standing somewhere like uh, 45 degrees north or south you will end up with um, um, a, a it's very small, you know, of the order of 0.1 degrees change um, coming about because of the difference between true gravity and gravity with a rotational component built in. Okay, so let's take a break there and we'll come back on the other side and deal with Coriolis force.